do it locally, I think. Okay, so, um, all right, so I will share my screen again. Um, and right now, so um, the motivation, so what I'm gonna talk about first is uh, kind of just a proof of concept I was trying to put together. Um, and the motivation is the side project uh, that I'm nominally the lead on now, uh, which is called the Philly Ward we Leaders website. Um, and it's basically an informational website. Um, um, and right now it has a feedback form and um, a big, you know, important part of this site is actually to try to, you know, keep the data up to date or collect new information. And um, the current feedback form is really ugly and it's going, the data goes to a partner organization um, while well, this site right now is basically being run by uh, Code for Philly, which is a Code for America brigade, if anyone is familiar with that. Uh, so basically it does, you know, civic, uh, civic coding projects. Um, so uh, basically, you know, this, this uh, website is basically a static website and is built with Vue.js 2. And it's, um, you know, as this, my idea was, can we figure out how to essentially take, build a form using Vue.js um, and then submit it uh, using something like Google Forms or anything else where we can easily capture the data. Uh, Google Forms I uh, picked uh, as an example because you know, the organization Code for Philly already uses you know, Google Analytics and they use various Google Docs for, for their projects. Um, so putting the data in there um, you know, it could basically already go into a shared, um, you know, uh, form in, in that organization's uh, workspace. Uh, and another point of that is kind of continuity. So when I took over this project, the previous uh, lead had done a ton of work building it up and then had basically left the country um, and no one knew how to update it or deploy it or do anything. So um, just getting it kind of to a stable baseline has, has you know, taken a, quite a while. Um, so it can be updated and deployed now, which was a big, a big, uh, win. Um, and so, um, this, um, see this issue, which I have, um, and so basically I was looking around and, you know, found some, um, references for, you know, how, basically, how can you do that? Um, and so this is kind of the one I was looking at and, um, it uh, suggests you could do it pretty pretty easily. Um, essentially, you, you put together your form, um, then you uh, essentially use the pre-filled form option to figure out the query parameters corresponding to each form field. Um, and then you can just make a request. Um, so, um, you know, and this person claims, okay, if you do this, you're, you're form data will get submitted. Um, and, you know, this is very easy just to make a request with uh, query parameters with the data. So, okay, so, uh, so here's the idea, right, that we're gonna just make a really simple form um, and uh, with a couple fields and we wanna be able to submit to it uh, with Vue.js. And so if I follow the instructions here, um, so I'll Put drop this in. Uh, can I put it in the chat? Let's see. Here we go. Um, so here, I'll just put this article I'm looking at for everyone, and I will put um, this issue link, which has some other related resources um, that kind of talk about the same topic. Um, Right, so what it basically says is go grab this thing that says get a pre-filled link. Um, and I'm just gonna say, you know, some some name and I already did this and you know, some comment, right? And if I click get link, um, then I copy the link. Um, and if you see, if I put it in the URL here, it gives me um 
basic query parameters that you know encode the name and comment that I entered. Um, and if I, um, you know, and I can even do change it and hit return, right? And it changes the values here, um, but it doesn't actually submit the form. And so then this person says, well, basically you have to go through and, you know, alter um, part of the URL that you just copied um, and tell it, hit this form response path instead of the um, submit response. And, you know, I think we could ourselves figure that out if we needed to, um, right? So we look at this form, um, we can see, um, right, the form action uh, goes to uh, form response. Um, so that's kind of the thing this person has has taken there. Um, I think you know, the trick is uh, that we can use a get request to populate them is great uh, as opposed to post. Um, doesn't really matter either way work, but this get one seems to work. So let me just pause there. If, if anyone has questions, comments, if I'm going too fast. Um, again, the motivation is just, you know, we want to build a feedback form essentially. Um, we want to under figure out how we can send a response to that feed and capture it in that feedback form, but we want to make the form the user submitting look like our own website and not like we don't want to like embed the Google form. So that's is that clear? Okay, so. All right, so how do we put that together then? Um, so if I go, so I basically for this, um, you know, copy pasted various files out of that Code for Philly uh, project and just made a super small uh, demo project. Um, this, um, I'm pushing up to GitHub also. So you, if you guys want to look at it, it's pathetically terrible, but might give you a place to start if you want to do something similar. Um, so, um, so. So you can see I, uh, you know, pushed this 36 minutes ago. So I was super prepared for this. Um, and here's where it is. Um, so, um, so the index page basically just, you know, defines an app where the the Vue.js uh, is going to bind. Um, then, kind of the main JavaScript file. Does that it says look for you know the div with ID app. Um, this this uses basically just a router view. So if you use the view router, um, it um, just essentially renders whatever uh, should be at that path based on the router. Um, the router here um, is bringing in two pages essentially. Um, one of which is just the home that I land on, and one of which is going to be a feedback form. So um, realize I'm going quickly here. Uh, so let me just pause. Uh, I don't know if people have seen uh, Vue.js before. Um, it's, uh, you know, I like it sort of because it's great for making lists of things, which is what we do a lot of in, in my job. Um, um, and reasonably okay for making forms and submitting them. Uh, also, we do a lot of that. Um, Peter, there's a question in the chat. It says, oh yeah, okay. do we have to create an uh, API key? For all um, no, forms? it does. So it looks, I mean, we'll, we'll see this, but you know, this form is publicly available, right? So you, what you're literally doing is just kind of pre-filling the form fields and submitting the form. So you don't need an API key or anything else because this is a, a form available for the anonymous users. 
Um, and so, you know, but Google apparently doesn't care if you use, uh, you know, an AJAX request essentially or a JavaScript request to submit the form as opposed to just doing it yourself. Um, so that's a great question. Like if uh, we were on a Drupal site or some other site, right, and you were logged in, you had to be logged in to submit the form, you'd expect that you would need, um, yeah, some kind of authentication token, or you'd have to provide a, you know, cross site, cross forgery protection token um, in order to submit that form. Um, any other questions? Uh, what if you want a private one? Um, so if you want a private form, um, that would be uh, quite a bit trickier. Um, so because to access that form, you would have to navigate it to it as the logged in user. So I don't think that this trick is going to work um, for a private form. I mean, you know, at that point, you could um, you could probably build up a form that actually the form action is a post over to the Google form. Um, and when the user hit it, Google might see that they're authenticated and submit it. So, but they would probably end up on that Google form submission page as opposed to on your website. Like you wouldn't have a way to redirect them back. Does, does that make sense as, a, as an answer? Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, and then in, so down here, uh, so this is a feedback page. It is, is not very exciting right now. Um, so people haven't seen, this is kind of what a lot of Vue.js code looks like. Um, let me zoom in a little bit here. Um, so we have, uh, this is kind of a, a file that combines the HTML template, uh, some JavaScript code and some CSS. Um, so this is kind of our minimum form and we can, we'll go see what it looks like. Um, and it's pretty ugly, not particularly well styled, not doesn't look like any other site it should look like, but here's the idea, um, right? As we, you know, we define a form element, uh, we have an input, um, and the important part here for Vue.js is this V model name, and that connects it down uh, to this uh, reactive data property name. Uh, same thing here, V model comment, uh, and that so it basically means that the value of this input is going to be stored in this name. This value of this comment is going to be stored in the variable name comment. Um, we have a button submit. Um, and it basically says, when I click it, prevent the default, and then go call the submit form method. Um, so you see the submit form method uh, is not very fancy. It has uh, the URL uh, for the form response. Then encoding the query parameters and just passing through, right, the two values that someone entered in the form. Um, and then um, I'm using Axios, which is a very common uh, request library for JavaScript to basically do a GET request to that URL with these query parameters. And uh, basically, we're not going to get any response, uh, so we could probably do away with this. Um, and once that happens, uh, we change the value of this to true and change the message on the page. So. Um, Pause there again if anyone has uh, questions. Realize this may look look odd if you haven't seen this kind of file before with these three elements in the same file. But that's, you know, it's basically compiled into obviously JavaScript uh, that renders out all these things. One of the things I like most about Vue is the way it separates, you know, the separate, you know, styles and markup and, and JavaScript all in the same file. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been appreciating this too, having, you know, previously had to work with JavaScript where, you know, you're ri writing it against some markup that is rendered somewhere completely different and you're hoping, you know, that they match up um, and you don't have any good way to keep them in sync. So here at least they have a great way to, you know, you basically everything stays in sync because it's just all in one file um, for a given component. 
Um, okay, so um, if we go over, sorry, the Uh, meeting controls are getting my way here. All right, so we will go here. So I am running um, this on my local host. This is using a Webpack dev server. Uh, and um, the nice thing about that is um, if we go over here um, and we go, for example, to the home page and we say this is a demo, you know. Right, and we change the text. Um, this uh, one, we save it. Should where well, there we go. Reload it um, automatically onto the page. So that's a, a nice thing about using this dev server. You don't have to like wait for a build, or you have to wait a couple seconds for a build, but then it automatically reloads it um, without you reloading the page. Um, the other thing you see here, this um, link is a router link. Um, so this is actually a very super simple single page application, right? So when I click this link, I'm not actually navigating. I'm not making web requests. I'm just, view is just loading uh, the new component and the content on the page. Um, so you'll have to, um, you know, forgive the, the terrible look of this. Uh, I'm not a front end developer, um, but uh, so, um, Um, right, so if I fill some th things in here and um, look at my JavaScript console and network tab, hopefully these, everyone loves these tools. Um, right, so I'm going to hit submit and it says, thank you for your feedback, right? So change the message. Uh, you'll see that um, this made a request over here. Um, it's telling me it has an error, um, even though it has a 200 response uh, that basically this um, no control allow origin. Basically, JavaScript doesn't allow you to get content across origin. Um, but that's okay because we don't need the response. All we care about is submitting the form, um, right? So if I look at this, um, I go over here and I look at my list of responses. Look, I have the one I just submitted um, in my list of responses. So it worked. That's that's pretty much um, the point of this. So. Now I've kind of connected it together. Um, it'd be nice if there was some some way not to have this. I can probably um, yeah yeah figure out how to not have access through this console error, which is pretty ugly. Um, but you know, at the at the least, like the end user just looking at this doesn't see any problem, right? And their data got submitted to my form. So. Um, um, of course, but um, core errors are serious and need to be addressed. I, I was looking at a library today, as a matter of fact, that dealt with cores. Maybe I, I was, I'll, I'll put it in the I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think the thing with cores, I mean, yeah. So we can we can definitely work around it, but the the basic problem is right that this Google form is not sending back headers that say you are allowed to access me from across origins. Um, so it's, a uh, right. Well, we, we, you know, I mean, you're not going live with something like this. So you're just trying to get the, the, the basics down first. Right. Well, right? you know, and it's, as I said, it, it, it does work to submit the data. Right. And, and yeah, so the worst, worst thing is you just have to figure out how to suppress the console error if you, if you don't care about it. Right. <laughs> we, we don't, we don't care about any of those. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so. <laughs> Peter, the, the real value is the data in the Google yeah. infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
as opposed to like um, Firebase or a NoSQL or something that they would be hard to access. They have, they could do all their Google Sheets on it and all that. Yeah, so yeah. right, the nice nice thing about this, right, is I can, uh, like, you know, they, they basically like let you click this button and then it puts all the responses in a spreadsheet. So, you know, again, the, the goal here is, hey, I have volunteers potentially coming, uh, someone submitted, uh, feedback saying they have new information or there's something wrong on the site that needs to be updated. Um, yeah, I want to make it easy for other volunteers at Code for Philly to look at that list and kind of, you know, take the data in and do something with it. Um, so that's why, yeah, it's, you know. You could the, leverage similar for like Smartsheets backend or. Yeah. Or, yeah, so that's pretty awesome. Okay, and the other thing um, that I would just highlight here, and just as a quick thing, um, so one of the the nice features about Vue.js, if you haven't seen this, um, is um, in the style section you can put this attribute scoped, um, and so what that does is it actually says whatever CSS rules I put into this section. They're only going to apply to things in this template. Um, so they're not going to cascade throughout other parts of my page. Um, and that might sound like magic, um, but it's actually uh, relatively straightforward. Um, and what you can see here is that um, the HTML elements um, in this component, because I said it was scoped, get an extra attribute here. Um, Right, and so the um, if you see, look at the h, the styling here. I wish I had some way to make this bigger. Um, so hopefully you can see that. But it says it's using a bracket and the attribute name in here uh, to apply the CSS uh, style. So that way, um, you know, there's not going to be anything else that has this kind of randomized attribute name anywhere else on the page. Hopefully, um, and so we only get um, this uh, rule applied to the thing that we care about. So, um, okay, so I think that's it for that part of it, um, unless anyone has more questions. Um, and let me just, uh, here, I'll pause and double check the chat also. Um, so question in the chat about a uh, scope styling in React. So um, that's not a question I know. Does has anyone here use React and know React supports that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, if you use um, like CSS, uh, React CSS modules, it does much the same uh, where you know, as it, if you import, you know, the CSS, as, you know, if you have, if, you, if you've got a, um, a React component, you know, say, you know, component, you know, dot JSX or whatever, and you, and you do the same thing, you, you can create a CSS file called uh, component dot module dot CSS or SCSS if you're using uh, like SAS or a preprocessor um, and then import that as part of the compile compilation of that and yeah you, you you basically get those same scoped styles for that component yep that's correct that's how I did it before too exactly how you, if you link it call with exact name the CSS and then the JavaScript file, it actually makes it directly to that. So only will get triggered by that uh, component. Okay, so sounds, yeah, sounds similar. Um, I mean, and obviously you could, you know, write those things by hand, but a lot nicer to have the, the framework shove it in there for you. Um, any other questions, um, comments, things people want to talk about uh, kind of front end wise? Um, no, okay. Um, 
All right, well, then I will. Um, jump in here and see if I can. Um, show you the rest of this. Um, so here's kind of the. Um, the problem, as it were. Um, let's see. Uh, let me do this in a incognito window, at least. Right. So here's our our camp registration form. Right. You know, I can pick a level, fill it out. Um, blah blah. blah. I have to agree to the COVID policy, and in order to complete the registration, we need to proceed to the payment portal. Um, so. Here's a problem, right? So someone registered on my site um, and they hopefully, when they submit the form, we redirect them to the payment portal, um, but we don't have a way to actually um, automatically link their payment to their uh, registration for the event. Um, so previously, yeah, we used Eventbrite um, and collected the money and then sent it to our fiscal sponsor, but um, if we did that, we'd pay a lot of extra fees. So we're trying to use uh, the fiscal sponsor. Um, um, and, you know, what the contributions look like there, the form, you know, when they get here, right? So they get um, essentially, you know, they're going to land on this form, um, right? And actually, again, we probably. Uh, Look more um, meaningful if I was anonymous here, um, right? And come in here, and by default, like all these fields are blank, um, you know, and they're going to have to fill them out or leave them blank. Um, and so we may just get ba basically nothing <laughs> for the name of the person, um, even when we see the payment uh, details um, in our back end. So that's kind of you know where we're where kind of the problem. Um, the question was how how do we make it so that when someone submits their payment here, we actually get that data connected back um, to our Drupal website and connected to their uh, camp registration. Um, okay, so um, this is where custom modules development comes in because unfortunately there is not. Um, not uh, a out of the box solution for this. Um, and so as I said, we're using this open collective um, organization. Uh, so that's a, essentially a 501c3 fiscal sponsor. Um, and that lets us you know, essentially act as a tax exempt organization for taking um, donations. Um, and one of the things that they offer um, is they have webhooks. Um, and so I don't know if people have used webhooks before, but this is uh, basically a way that if you, for example, take some action here, um, they have integration with various things like Slack, Discord, Zapier, uh, so on and so forth. Um, those, you know, are webhooks uh, or work through webhooks. Um, the webhook is basically just uh, you give it a URL and it's going to send you um, a data payload when something happens. Um, and in particular, the one that I'm looking at here and you know, corresponds to this custom module um, is this receive ticket webhook, right? And so when a ticket is confirmed, I want it, their site to send data over to me um, at this URL. Um, the other one I have going on is basically uh, for debug purposes. Um, this is another module I wrote because uh, um, um, I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on and in the interaction between two websites. Um, so this is a Pretty dumb little module, but basically, if you turn it on, you have different options, including you can dump out uh, all the requests to a certain path to your, you know, private files, um, and then go back and look at them later. Um, so that's what I'm 
kind of doing here. So uh, sending all their webhooks over to our site and just it's saving them in the file system so I can go back and look at them. And that was helped me do the development, right? So I had that data available um, and then helped me do debugging when their site was actually broken and not sending the right data. Um, um, yeah, so so here's just kind of the starting point. So we know, okay, the, the person submits their ticket. Um, uh, you can um, get a get the data back, but that still doesn't get us all the way there, right? So how um, how are we going to connect our registration to um, to the fact that um, they came from our site? Um, so. Um, Um, so in order to do that, uh, unfortunately, I had to look at their front and back end code, um, and which is all written in JavaScript and TypeScript. Um, and I, I won't dive into it uh, in detail. Um, and of course, I've even forgotten where this stuff is now. Um, but um, you know, kind of if you dig in here um, and you look at something like their order, um, it you know it has a lot of obvious things, but um, it it has the option to store tags on an order, and basically digging in through through their code um, and talking to people in their Slack, uh, basically the idea was you could put a, you know a query string with some tags that you wanted to attach to the order. Um, into the URL when you sent the user over to their site, um, and that should be propagated through um, through and stored with their order, and then uh, with you know again a little help and some pull requests uh, had that included in the webhook data uh, that gets sent back to us. So that's kind of the idea. Um, so we're gonna we submit a registration. Um, the user, um, uh, you know, fills out uh, the payment info, um, and then we get that data sent back to us. And um, just uh, let's see. Um, let's see. So. This is a development version of the site, and just to show you kind of the uh, the full flow here. Um, and this is a little outdated from the live one. Um, but here, I'm just going to do a test. Oh, did I take away the? I took away the zero dollar ticket. OK, well. Um, all right. Well, I'm not going to show you the full, the full flow. Then, no. Well, I can do that. You. Well, or let me pause there. Do people want to actually see the flow, or are you going to believe me that that it sends you over to the other site with a query parameter in the URL? I'll I can show you how that how that happens. But I don't know that you actually have to see the live demo. Um, but basically, the way that happens um, is here. So when you submit the form, uh, so we're using the web form module. If people are using Drupal, you should know about web form. It's a great tool. Um, and so we have here a URL, the option when you submit the form, it sends you to a new URL. Um, and we're doing something funny here, which is Registration dash, and then we're doing the ticket value. So basically, the this is the key in the select list for tickets. Um, if I go um, the form right and inspect this, the uh, you know the option has a particular value, um, and basically when that's submitted, 
um, it's going to be the thing that comes in here into the path. Um, and then I'm going to populate the query string with values uh, that show up on that um, open collective site um, and pre-fill the form with the user's name and email based on what they submit on the form. Uh, so again, taking the submission values from the web form uh, and web form does have the ability, though it's not well documented to URL and code uh, the submitted values uh, so that it works. Um, and then finally, at the end here, um, this is the important part, right? I build up a tags query string. And um, SID stands for submission ID. And you see, basically, I'm just passing through uh, the ID corresponding to the the thing they just submitted, uh, the registration form, uh, their particular form submission, um, and pass that through as a tag. Um, um, and you may be wondering, OK, well, how does that work? Um, because this is a path on the local Drupal site. Um, right? So it's not going over to this open collective site at all. Um, it's, where was I? Um, and so the other piece there is we have um, URL redirects. Um, and you can see, so for general admission or individual sponsor, um, we're redirecting you uh, directly to the ticket. And the advantage of using this redirect is uh, we do have a way also to have a free ticket uh, where we don't want you to go to the other site. And that has essentially a blank um, value for the ticket code, the, the type of ticket, right? Because you got a, essentially a free one. And that just sends you over, redirects you to a page that says, thanks you for registering as a volunteer. Um, so where was I? Right, so again, you know, if I click general admission, comes over here, hits the redirect. The redirect module will pass through the query string, so that's a nice thing, um, and then send me again over to here uh, to order tickets. Uh, oh, for 2022. Okay. Um, sorry, that was the 2022 one, uh, and we have the 2023 in here somewhere also. Um, yeah, down here. OK, so pause, questions? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I'm trying to put my hand up. Mm -hmm. I, don't see, I don't see the icon. Oh, maybe it's down here at the bottom. OK, I so will, well, I can't really see well, the screen sharing, so just <laughs> shout out. <laughs> OK, well, I'm speaking anyway at this point. So yeah. I've, I've lost the thread a little bit here. So, okay. so is, you, is, your, is your problem that you're getting registrations on Open Collective that uh, this Drupal site does not know about, and likewise, perhaps you don't know about? No. So really, the problem is someone submits the web form. Uh, we want to send them over to Open Collective to pay us. Um, but uh, we get a list of transactions on Open Collective, but the transaction might say essentially anonymous or guest for the name. Um, so, oh, uh, okay. So the the goal is, you know, kind of first off to pre-populate people's names so that those transactions uh, more often have their name on them than um, than you know saying guest or anonymous. Um, and then by using that tag, we're making a connection in the data between the web form submission and their payment. And I'll kind of get kind of try to close the loop in terms of the, the code um, uh, after this. But so that's that's kind of the idea so that then we can actually have a record in our site and say for this web form submission, I have data back from Open, Open Collective that tells me that they actually paid, right? And not have to kind of manually reconcile our uh, registration with our payments. Right. I I got it. Nothing like a, the need for a cron or something like that, right? Yeah, I got it. You, you mentioned a couple of things. They they 
is sent over to Open Collective and um, um, expected data is not is not there when they get there. And so sometimes you're getting anonymous registrations, which you know no one would anonym make an anonymous res registration when they're spending thirty five to fifty dollars or more, right? right? They would want their name attached to that. Right. What's well, anonymous payment? Yeah. The the problem is the payment doesn't have a name on it. So they registered, but we don't have an easy way to link the payment to their ticket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think I've got it now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Okay. So they said the goal, right? The goal is to, um, collect uh, as much as possible linkages between their um, registration and the payment. Um, the other thing I did in here, and it seems like not everyone um, is playing along, but um, I basically uh, tried to maximize my opportunities for collecting this data. So I also discovered that they support on Open Collective a parameter called redirect. Um, so when I got to the end of uh, making a contribution, it gave me the option to click a link to go back essentially to the Drupal Camp New Jersey site. Um, and in that link, um, I basically did the same thing and embedded the web form submission ID. So mm. now um, hopefully I will get the webhook data, but as I said, that wasn't initially working. And this is kind of just a, an alternative confirmation um, that they paid because if they click that link and come back to the site, um, you'll see that I can grab the web form submission and link it back. Uh, basically, another confirmation that they actually paid. Um, not not actually as good as web form data as the webhook data. We'll see, and I might do away with this, but I, I was kind of desperate to make it work um, as as at the start. No, so, it's good. I'll, that's that's reassuring. It's a, yeah. a a person is being sent somewhere else, hands off their money, and then they're sent back to you. That's right. that's a good user experience. Right. So yeah, that was the ideal, right? We don't want them to kind of get stuck there. We want them to come back and uh -huh. thank them for registering, right? Yeah, um, that too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, okay, so that's kind of you know, the motivation there. Um, so let's take a look. Um, at uh, the code. So, um, all right, so where do we want to start with the code? Um, uh, I'd have some un uncommitted changes, but they aren't major. Um, okay, so let's just start with data model, right? So that's, um, um, important thing, and um, it may seem a little silly, but but it um, if you've done this before uh, with you know Drupal nine slash ten, it's actually pretty easy uh, to build up what are what's called a custom entity type, and um, you can actually just think of this basically as a wrapper on an SQL data table. I mean that's that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it, and I treat it. Um, but it gives you um, a bunch of extra facilities, including it gives you present potentially the, the ability to integrate um, with uh, Drupal views. I haven't done that yet, but you know the idea is I can take this data and I can take my web form data and mash them together using views if I wanted to. Um, so that's an important thing. Plus, it gives me a way to kind of just automatically build up a bunch of these forms. Um, so. Um, you'll see here, this is uh, defining a base table. That's the data table um, I'm going to be in. Um, and I have to go look and see if I can get on this. But um, the base field definitions are basically just a you know, list of fields that are going to go in that one SQL table. Um, or they might go in alternate tables if, if they're multi-value. I think these are all single value. Um, so web form is the thing I want to capture, right? That's an entity reference, actually, the ID of the web form that they submitted. Um, some other data, just the order ID, the type of order, their name, which ticket they paid for, how much they paid, 
when it was created. Um, and then I'm just capturing all the data that came in the webhook, just in case. Um, and, you know, some other fields here, like when was this created or changed, which probably don't matter that much, but um, are kind of standard. Um, so uh, I'll sort of pause here if people, uh, if you haven't done uh, custom any type, this might not look super familiar, but um, one of the interesting things about this and other related kind of Drupal data is they use this annotation on the class to define uh, a lot of relevant properties. Um, and so you end up having to, you know, work as hard to do the annotation on the class as you do uh, sometimes writing the class itself. Um, and uh, so some of the things here define, for example, you know, what is the path, uh, what is the URL that I use to get to view one of these things? Um, you know, what are the, you know, keys? Um, this is, you know, not translatable. We're not making a multilingual version of this data. Um, and then defining a bunch of other classes that, that interact with this and kind of help manage it. Um, so. And did, did you did you write this from scratch or did you use Drush to generate it? Um, I, th I think I used Drupal console as a starting point. Um, oh though yeah. I may have copy pasted it. Uh, Drupal console also has a generation thing, which I've used. I don't, I don't think Drush has the built-in generation for this, does it? I'm not sure. It's just I haven't, I haven't been able to get console to work for a long time. You know, console no, no. And Drupal that is. Drush don't have so, a functionality for that. Excuse me. Yeah. Drush don't have a functionality for that. Yeah, I don't think oh, Drush, Drush doesn't do that. All right. Yeah, it's Drupal, Drupal console. Um, so, um. I put it in here. Just just to put folks at ease, right? You don't have to you don't have to know what all that stuff is. You just have to be right. able to tell a command a command line tool what you're looking to do, and it'll it'll just write all that stuff up for you. You know, put it put the file in the right place and the other and the other files it needs and so forth. Right. Yeah. I mean, Drupal console does a reasonable job of giving you a starting point. I mean, you definitely are going to want to go and tweak it. Um, in this case, I you know just deleted a bunch of the files because I wanted to make mm -hmm. it as simple as possible. Sure. Um, you know, and that's the learning curve. Like the first time I did it, uh, I didn't delete all those files. So now some of my projects have a bunch of extra files hanging around that aren't really that helpful. Um, and in a bunch of these, right, you see I can kind of defer to uh, whatever Drupal core provides, like the delete form, mm -hmm. um, which actually, I don't know why you'd want to delete them, but I guess I left that in there. Um, in other cases, you know, it's a custom class, but in a lot of cases, it have very little code um, in them. Um, so, and and is it is it normal practice to uh, write your field definitions on this file, um, like these, the base fields? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, I'm, it's really a question. Um, yeah, like I, I mean, thinking... at least when I've done it so far, yeah, I. You know, just put all the base fields right in this file. Um, mm -hmm. And again, like, you know, some, it really depends on your use case, right? So you may have very few base fields for some entity types um, because you want to use Drupal's field API to add, you know, to create different um, types of those, uh, you know, essentially subtypes of the entity and add different data fields to them. Um, in this case, I'm only going to have one type, and so you know all the all the fields are de defined here. Right, and and you fire. The, you, I mean, because I'm used. To, I guess I'm used to seeing something like this in an in, in an install hook. Mm -hmm. So or hook install, I guess is is, is yeah. how I say it. So um, you fire this once, and then how? How? Here's the question: How, how do you prevent it from firing again? Um, I mean, so Drupal, you know, calls this function and basically makes sure that these uh, things exist in the database. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. you know, it gets a little hairier if you want to change them later. Um, mm -hmm. But essentially, when you install the module and then, or um, and then you install uh, the entity type gets installed, and Drupal like looks through this and says, "Oh, I'm gonna you know create a database table and it's gonna have all the fields with the correct 
SQL types to hold the data that you've defined here. Oh, that sounds good. I'm mean, not not at all unusual. If you've done any work with doctrine, you would right. know that that yeah, they, they you know they don't they don't doctrine doesn't exactly do somersaults around this, but kind of does because yeah. what what you're looking at here is obviously a lot of work, but also a lot of methods and a lot of configuration and a lot of arrays and you know doctrine kind of just <laughs> yeah doctrine knows how to do that. It's the it's the answer to a lot of questions with doctrine. For, the, for those who haven't haven't spent spent a lot of time in that space, but yeah. mm -hmm. but good good for Drupal good for Drupal for catching up. Yeah, so this is uh, you know in Drupal's you know, schema API is also pretty, which is so my first pass in this module, which uh, uh, I don't think it's public currently, but you know I might make it. You could go back and look at the history. And my first pass, I made a you know hook schema, which is defined a very simple database table, and then I thought to myself, well that's that's not very convenient because now I have to write if I want like integration with views. If I want anything else, I have to write all that code by hand. And if instead I essentially define these base fields and give myself exactly the same SQL table, um, mm -hmm. Drupal does all the work for me, including you know this. It knows this is in any reference, so it can you know just load up the thing it's referring to or help connect them together. Um, right. and it's super convenient. Yeah, I, I'm I'm only interested in creating fields with these methods. Yeah. But ju just just for the you know for people who maybe don't aren't as familiar with this, you what you could do instead of this, and Peter, you would confirm, right? Is you mm -hmm. could go into the UI, do all the clicking to create these fields, then you would export the configuration of those fields, and then you'd have the same result. But uh, you know you that could can do, be you could do this for bundle fields. You can't do it for these base fields. So that's so writing a custom energy type and putting these fields, I think you can only do in code. Okay. Um, so that's, you know, that's where it becomes, you know, the custom module development. And, you know, again, this is not hard. Like you, you can well imagine that I basically copy pasted these and tweak them slightly from some example yeah. over and over again. Um, so, um, but yeah, you gotta, you know, get it right uh um, oh yeah i just 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 wanted to add i thought you right. know, it, was, it was a lot to look at and i wanted you know wanted, wanted us to do a little dissection here so that so that right. we could we could see how that it's really not the whole thing is really not that complicated right and then i don't know if we have field ui because what you're saying about a base field base field is usually the first field on the entity but if you're creating an entity type onto which you're adding fields in this case, entities, of course, may, maybe your only route are the are are those um, classes and methods. Right. So here, right. just uh, flipped over to yeah, Drupal's UI for for adding data fields, right? And you can see that. So for here, I'm on a basic page node type, right? And it just says the two fields are body and files, right? And but if I look at something like the display of the field or the form um the form right so we had yeah we, we have only body and files that we can add or remove but i have a lot of more fields right i have title i have authored by authored on etc cetera, etc cetera. Right. right and these are base fields on the node entity type right so those always come for every node type you don't have a choice about it question mm -hmm. real quick what about if you make like for instance like in your custom module what about if you just make a node creation and then actually make the yaml file to create the fields sure you can absolutely do that right so you could make a node type and you could make the custom yeah go in the ui here make all the fields um and do it that way um it's it's probably simpler um, I mean, in a lot of but, ways i mean yeah. well i mean i mean the other way i mean exactly the same way that you're actually speaking right now going through the admin and right. going, going through the ui but you, what about if you make the custom module and actually actually create that page for the yaml file to create the node for you that you want to name and then inject the fields that you want to do um well so usually what i would do in that case is actually i would go through the ui and then i would take the yaml files and put them in the custom module um because okay. it's it's just so easy to do it that way, and it's yeah, right. Writing the YAML by hand is that's true. Painful. Yeah, you yeah, because you export it out, and right. then you have it actually to config, and then you just add it into your custom module. Right. But the but the but the code that Peter showed us, I'm, I, I'd like to mention, it um, scales much better. 
Yeah, you know, so I, the, did a, I did a project where we, we were putting eight fields on 40 content types and you just didn't want to click all that. You wanted to have, you know, 150 lines of code and, and that did the whole yeah. job. Oh, okay. Right. No, that's not bad. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing about this is also, again, like this makes a very simple database table. So if you need to go and do anything, you know, look at the data, double check it, play with it, you know, Again, for for those purposes, it's nice just to ha have it a very simple flat table. Yeah, that scales better in the sense of like I've done it for like um, you know something like let's say uh, voter records. You know, so I want to load you know quickly load a hundred or two hundred thousand voter records. Um, it's it goes a lot quicker if you're inserting all those into one table than if you're having to insert those into twenty different tables for every row in the in the file. Oh, um, okay. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. So that's that's another example where I've done this before, where where a custom entity type might make sense because you know you of your knowledge of what you know the kind of underlying database performance. Um, so okay, so we've got that, um, and now we've got to handle uh, receiving the webhook and storing these things, right? So that's kind of the other um, piece of this, um, and. So in order to do that, um, we need to define a route and a controller. Um, maybe there's some other method for doing that, uh, but this is one that's relatively straightforward. Um, and so this is the Drupal routing file. And so this basically just defines uh, for this custom module, uh, the custom paths on the Drupal site um, that uh, will exist, um, right? And so I have basically these two things. One, this is kind of the redirect records the payment based on the web form submission. Uh, and then I have this um, other one that receives only post requests to receive the webhook data. Um, and then finally, uh, config form. Um, and if I go over here on either of these sites, you can see a um, couple things here I have in the configuration form. So first off, um, when you install this module, it randomly generates a token in the path um, because you don't want like random people on the internet posting data to this endpoint um, on your website. So that's uh, basically a way to protect um, yourself from uh, that, that kind of being spammed. Probably not a big risk, but uh, and then a redirect path. Um, so that's for uh, when they come back into the site um, from Open Collective, where, where do I want to send them um, after I've registered that they came back? Um, uh, I can show people what, what this code looks like if you care, but it's, it's pretty basic. Um, and then the more interesting stuff probably is in this uh, controller. Um, so, Um, so this is a controller class um, using the controller base class from Drupal. Drupal provides a lot of standard classes you can extend and get a lot of what you need when you're doing custom module development. It's you know rare that you are going to start totally from scratch. Um, PHP Storm has started like annotating that I committed this, which I don't really care about, but thanks. Um, and um, you'll see this, uh, these controller classes um, support a factory method. Um, and so this is a lot of Drupal does dependency injection um, with this kind of factory method. We inject the um, service container um, and then out of the service container, we get the things that we need to instantiate this class. Um, in particular, we're getting uh, the configuration. So this is the configuration basically that uh, comes from this configuration form. Um, get the entity type manager, which is a kind of very general purpose service and a logger, because we always need a logger um, in case something goes wrong. Um, and so we're basically just, you know, storing 
storing these, and then we call a method that's on the base class to set the logger. Um, okay, and then um, the main, well, there's two, if we look back at our routing file, we mentioned two methods on this controller class. We mentioned uh, the controller itself is one method, and then we have down here custom access. And so I don't know if people have used this, um, but I find it actually very handy often if I have a custom controller to use this custom access requirement and just uh, reference a method that's in the same controller, and that helps me keep all my code together and organized. Um, and so this is um, the way we're going to limit the access to posting that data, right, is so here's an access check, and uh, the method parameter uh, is token. Um, and just Drupal connects these things together. So if you look at the routing definition, you see this thing in the path is named token. Um, and then I can come over here and basically have a variable with the same name, and it's going to get populated uh, based on what's in the URL path. Uh, so that's very handy, very easy. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is in the configuration, I'm going to look for this auto randomly generated value. Um, and basically, I'm going to say, um, first off, you know, you have to have a token and you have to have an expected token or you don't get access. Um, and then you're allowed if that passed and the expected token and the token are exactly equal. And I'm using this uh, built in function hash equals. Uh, again, this is like super overkill for this use case. Um, but, but, but wait, hmm? but wait, hey, can, do you do you mind hovering over hash equals? Where does that come from? Uh, this is built into PHP. And it's been around, so oh, 5.6. Yeah. Well, that would have saved me a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I didn't yeah. know about that then, yeah. <laughs> right, so this function, uh, basically what it does is it does a, constant time string comparison between so there are timing attacks where someone for example submits some kind of hash or partial password and if you're comparing it one character at a time to like a secret value um an attacker can by making lots of requests and seeing how quickly that comparison happened uh they can start to guess the characters in your secret um so this function hash equals Again, completely overkill for this use case, uh, but best practice um, means that they can't make a timing attack and send in randomized tokens or you know start to build up the token one character at a time and see, hey, if I have a match, it takes longer uh, because it starts comparing to the next character in the string. Um, so that's, I, that's the but, I, but I just wanted to remark about the because yeah. uh, I wrote that by hand one time. Yeah. You know, a, a hash compar comparison tool. And uh, yeah, well, there you go, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I think, you know, there were there was some version of this maybe in Drupal 7 or something before this was built into PHP. So, um, oh, yeah. okay. Well, thanks. You're being nice. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's good. Good, good. You know, good. That's, that's what you get when you, you know, you hang around this stuff, you know, right. Just continue to learn. Yep. And then, okay. And then here's the real, you know, business end of this uh, controller class. Uh, so this method called webhook. And you see here, I'm doing something a little different and I'm asking for the request. Um, and Drupal, when you write a controller, uh, which is basically just some code that responds to a route, um, what you're allowed to do is, in addition to asking for the slugs, uh, you know, the named variables in the path, you are also allowed to ask for the current request. Um, and uh, basically that's what we need in this case. Um, and I've just left for myself an example of what the JSON data looked like um, coming in here uh, from, you know, an example uh, that I did for myself. You can see this was obviously a $0 example because I didn't want to have to pay for my test data. Um, um, and so you can see, you know, so this has like the type, some IDs, um, the name of the person. Um, and yeah, the important thing, remember our original use cases, we want to connect 
uh, the webhook response saying a ticket was purchased to the web form. And remember, I told you that I could put tags, um, associate tags to the order. And if I did that, then once everything's working, those tags actually come through in the webhook. Um, so that's um, that's the key thing to remember here. That's kind of uh, what we're looking for. Um, and so the last part here, this is kind of not exciting code, but uh, basically just JSON decoding um, whatever came through uh, in the webhook. So the, the entire content of the request. Um, and then basically if the webhook was of type ticket confirmed, I'm going to go and do some more work here. And the first thing I want to do is say, did I get a tag? Um, if I got a tag, I'm going to split it. And I gave myself the option to be either using a colon or a dash, just because why not? Um, uh, preg split just splits the string based on a regular expression. And I'm going to split it into a maximum of two parts, and I don't want any empty parts. Um, and basically, I say if the first part is SID, so that's the web form submission ID, um, and I got something else, and the other part uh, was of type digit. So this is a helpful PHP function, uh, checks that the string you got is all numeric digits. Um, then I'm like, great. Then I got a session ID. Um, and uh, yeah, I started out with this null, right? Like, and so if I didn't get one, I'm just gonna say my submission is null. If I did get one, I'm using the storage for web form submissions and loading that up. Great. Now, if I got a valid ID, um, I basically just do the last part of the work, which is creating uh, one of my custom entities. Um, and so again, I'm using this entity type manager, uh, which is kind of your entree into the whole world of entities, entity API in Drupal, getting the storage uh, for my custom entity type. Uh, storage is basically this thing that allows you to load and save them. Um, setting up an array of properties based on the JSON data, um, as well as the web form submission that I found. Um, so this is again, a entity reference. So this field is going to be referencing this other object, um, and then fill in the rest of the data. And then I just dump everything in this last field, which was a blob, um, create my new custom entity and save it. Um, and if it wasn't working, and this is how I found out that there was a bug in the their code at one point, you know, I logged, logged a warning here. Mm -hmm. And then I returned success, which is probably not necessary, but maybe it makes you feel better. So that's kind of the, the business end of it, how I take their JSON webhook data that's posted to me, you know, decode it, analyze it, and then save one of these custom entities uh, based on what came in. So uh, pause there and any questions? Where, where does data begin? Is it up a few lines? Where does this, the props or something else? No, the, the data, the data variable. Uh, it's here. Oh, and there's your JSON decode right, right about yeah. that. Got it, okay. Yep. So yeah, I mean, again, this is not, Code is not fancy, but um, then um, once we have it, right? So um, oh, I don't have it right because it wasn't working. Um, so we can go to the live site to see some that works. So these were, so I have other code that works in a very similar way for when you come back after that redirect and we're going to save something, right? So I linked this entity ID over to your web form submission. Uh, it's, Submission number 36, and you know, again, this is probably some some test data here. Um, if we go over to the live site and see, we actually are now starting to get the web hooks coming in. Um, and someone just re you know registered recently. Great. Uh, clearly, I need to fix this because um, I'm putting their name and not the order ID. Um, but and you know, if I I don't know why I left this open to me. If I needed to create one by hand, let's say I needed to backfill the data, I could do that also. Um, 
but you know, if I click through this now, you know, I get basically the view of this entity. This is something Drupal core gives me kind of for free is just rendering out all the data that's in that, that data table. So I didn't have to write any of this to just, you know, stick this on, on the field. Oh, and I can see, see that they paid, uh, 3,500 cents. <laughs> it's not formatted. Right. It's yeah. What, what about, I, I know we've been on for a while, but do you have mm. time for one more question? Sure. Well, what, what about, for instance, my, you know, um, my um, ticket, okay. I, I see Chris there and, and, and someone and, and two other people. What, I mean, the, the, you've got legacy, right. you know, um, registrations to get in. Right. So, yeah, that's why I left this open. So we could potentially backfill that data if we needed to, if we wanted to have it all in place. Uh, I mean, on Open Collective, um, you know, we do get a list of all the um, the transactions. So we can basically go through here, right? And you see, like, this transaction was from Incognito. Um, but mm. Uh, that's a, that that, was, yeah that's your that's a problem but but right it, that that was actually tim plunkett so so i actually got that data coming back because the web form it connected it back to his web form even though he on here it said incognito right and you know for some of these people filled out names for some of them they didn't fill out names uh, right. like this one was guest but you know we haven't had so many ticket purchases yet that we couldn't match them up but again mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be manual reconciliation Oh, uh, manual. Okay. I was thinking you could get a dump from somewhere, download CSV, yeah. and then maybe uh, you could do it. We do could. Yeah. They, or... they have a um, GraphQL API that I could pull this data out of, oh. um, or at least the order data. Um, but it wouldn't really help me because at that point, we didn't have the web form IDs in with the tick with the order data. Um, so it's still basically, I would still just have to reconcile it based on timestamp or something. That, oh, okay. Well, not... Yeah. No, no. It's just a question. I just, just, yeah. just one, just wondering. I mean, I'm not feeling defensive. You know, right. I'll show, I'll show up, and you'll know it's me, sure. and, I'll, <laughs> and you'll believe me that I paid, right? You yeah. Know? <laughs> but, but, um, I was just, it was just a question. Sure. So you, no, no, so, it, it's so, totally so, fair. Yeah. I mean, so, so yeah. Just for those, we'll. I mean, basically, we've looked at them all, and we're like, yeah, those people all paid, so we may not even bother putting the data in. Um, yeah. We'll, but you'll have it for next year. But for yeah, for next time we do this, hopefully we, yeah, we'll have this working from the start, so we won't yeah. you know have that problem again. Yeah, great. Okay, so I'm getting close to nine, so I'll probably stop there unless anyone else has questions about that custom code. That's not, and some people are still on the call, so I didn't bore you all to death. Great. <laughs> All right, so does anyone else have uh, any other topics they have questions on? Um, um, and um, and or something they'd like to share in the last few minutes? I don't have any questions about the topics that you presented on, but I was wondering, uh, I wanna, I, I joined this to network and bounce ideas and uh, just learn things that I can from anyone who's interested. So I wanted to know if anybody would be open to networking with me, uh, just sharing any information they might be willing to provide where we could direct message and not waste the time of the whole group. Um, yeah, well, I think one, one of the best ways to reach some of us is to go in the Slack channel that we use. Um, so there's that was a question a, I actually wanted to bring up is, is there yeah. a Slack channel for this group and you know, where would I find that? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, so if you go to uh, drupal.org slash Slack or uh, the place it redirects you to, um, so go to that or um, then send you over to this little much longer link. Um, that gives you instructions on joining the Drupal community Slack. Um, inside that Slack, uh, there are a bunch of different, you know, helpful channels. Um, but for this group in particular, there's a channel named uh, New Jersey, um, New Dash Jersey. 
Um, and so, you know, lots of people that are on this call or who are coming to the camp, um, uh, you know, are in there on and off. And, you know, both in that uh, place, so I see Eric's already in there. Um, uh, or, you know, other channels, you know, people uh, are definitely available to talk about, you know, front end, back end development, different, different topics like that. Um, it was also you can post comments um, on the meetup itself on the on the meetup event and that uh, I believe those comments generally go out to you know people who were registered for the event so if you're trying to reach someone you missed that that might be a way to do it um, and of course uh, come to Drupal Camp New Jersey in March uh, you get to meet people face to face and someday we may go back to having this meetup in person uh, you know for many many years we were doing this monthly in person at Princeton University, uh, still kind of in pandemic mode, um, but obviously that makes it accessible to a wider range of people also, so. All right, any other uh, questions or last, last thoughts as we uh, wrap up here?